thank, thank you, Javon. Um, could I go now to Roshanara, please? Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Uh, I, my question, uh, first question is to the governor um, and picking up on the points that um, Professor, um, Mr. Broadbent made about the shape, the V-shape, which doesn't sound like a V-shape. Um, and perhaps um, he might come back and say, which letter uh, would be a better exposition of the scenario that's been painted? Um, and also the fact that uh, Professor Haskell um, uh, voted, you know, the vote um, for his vote for an increase in quantity of easing seems to reflect a greater pessimism um, towards the economic outlook. So taking all of that into account and what, um, Mr. Bailey, you've already said to our chair um, around the stability of the banking sector, potential for extended lockdown, rising unemployment, scarring, um, also regional inequality, which we haven't touched on. Um, and of course, the B word, which has um, had fewer mentions more recently um, in terms of Brexit and a potential deal at the end of the year, which may still mean um, not frictionless trade and possibly even a no deal Brexit. What does it mean for banking stability and the economic outlook. Are we still looking at a V shape or are we looking at some other shape? Well, I'm not, to be honest with you, really much taken with using letters to describe okay. uh, this. But, you know, I know it's a, it's a convenience that, that gets used. I, I, I think just to draw on, I know probably some points have been made, I, there are a number of things that drive the sort of the, the, the up leg of the, of the scenario that we have. First, obviously, the you know, the, the timing and period of lifting the restrictions. Yeah. yeah. Just at when and at what pace that happens will have a big effect because this is different. I mean, if there is any such thing as a standard recession, this is different. People will obviously start doing things. And we're already seeing so. And by the way, I mean, we see that in China, which obviously is further ahead in terms of coming out. Um, you know, you do see a recovery of activity, and you actually do see quite interesting differences in China in you know, what is recovering more quickly and what, and what isn't. But you do see a recovery as the restrictions get lifted. The second thing is that we, like Ben said, we included in the scenario, however, a period of what I would call natural caution by choice. I, even when the government says you can do things, consumers will be cautious about what they do. Governor, can I just probe on the, the the specifics, which is what does all this mean for our constituents? What does it? People are very worried. Obviously, we're all very concerned. Mm. What does it mean for banking stability if the scenario is much more pessimistic going forward, which it could well be, as some of you already alluded to? And what does Brexit mean towards the end of the year? People are beginning to get worried about that again. Well, we need to have a sense of where we're heading and of course the country is looking to you and your team to give us some sense of direction well we've given you as much direction as we can we've discussed this earlier i think we've discussed at length the stability of the banking system we've made the point john has made the point very clearly i made it earlier and on brexit well brexit frankly we, we condition as we always do we conditioned the scenario and all the analysis we did around the report on government policy government policy is you know, the, the, this process will be completed at the end of the year and there will be a trade deal. Um, and we will obviously follow that very closely. We, by the way, obviously are you know, assisting where we can in terms yep. of the work on financial services equivalents. Um, I have to be honest with you, at the moment, it's, it's not the dominant issue. Sure. The dominant issue is COVID, yep. um, to be clear. Of course. What I, would say, what I would say with your constituents is we are doing... Uh, everything we can. We have responded very rapidly and with, a, frankly, a lot of firepower for the reason that, you know, I keep, I've said it a number of times, and I'll say it again, because it's crucially important. Within the sort of framework of our policy, within the inflation target, we yeah. are doing everything we can to support the economy. We're, yeah. you know, we've, we've done record amounts of QE in volume, and we're doing record yeah. amounts of QE in, in flow. And that is deliberate. And one of the big things we're doing is, is we are keeping the cost of borrowing down because that feeds through into the state of the economy. Thank you. And Thank you, Governor. I just want to I just want to uh, probe you further on this point. Sure. You, so what you've done is very welcome. Absolutely. But there are 
as you've heard from Siobhan and others, there are major gaps in terms of the government's response, such as new starters, such as the hundreds of thousands of people who are in the seasonal work in the restaurant and catering and hospitality mm. sector and so on. Uh, many of those people are getting very little help. Uh, lots of them don't qualify for welfare, which is the government's default. And then you've got the spectre of a million unemployed young people and another lost generation. So I suppose the, the issue for us is how can we make sure that that long-term scarring effect doesn't have a, the knock-on effect on the economy, which all of you will be very are familiar with, and what else can be done to address those gaps? I appreciate it straddles into policy, but yeah. can you, well, where, where, do we, where do we go from here well, to address those gaps? Let me say two things. It, it does straddle, of course, outside our responsibilities, but I think the job retention scheme is is a very sensible policy. One of the reasons that we've got, you know, faster recovery than you know, quotes a normal recession, is because we do believe it will enable people to come back into their, into into work, uh, faster. Um, it, it, it's a, to my mind a very sensible policy in that respect. Now, obviously, the chancellor has got to take some important decisions. He's made an announcement about 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 sort of timing, but obviously he's got some important decisions to take about his point about the employer's contribution, that's for him. But, you know, I, I strongly support that as a policy. I think it is helping, you know, it's helping people. Um, secondly, uh, and that will help to reduce scarring because as Ben was saying earlier, one of the causes of scarring obviously is having lower long-term unemployment yep. uh, or having higher long-term unemployment, I apologize. The second thing obviously is the whole set of measures around supporting uh, firms and supporting firms to survive through this shock. The various lending programs of which we're operating the commercial paper facilities and about 20 billion pounds outstanding now. Many of those companies are companies that employ a lot of people and quite a lot of low paid people as well, I can assure you. And one of the things that I'm absolutely determined about is we are going to publish the names of firms that borrow because it's important that we do for transparency. But I want people to understand when they, you know, the rationale behind this is to, is to support employment and the, and the livelihood of people in this country, of your constituents. I'm sure I'll get told that, you know, I should have applied a green factor to it or something, and, and I'm very supportive of that. But the, the clear and present need at the moment is to support people's livelihoods, frankly, and thus support the economy. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so, John, I have a question for you, which is is in relation to just picking up in the last session we talked about supply chains and the international dimension uh, and um, of course there are lots of arguments about globalization um, and so on and um, what, what do you think would be the impact of a retreat from globalization and also in in terms of supply chains and the impact of certain countries because of the behavior of some of our companies for reasons to do with sometimes distress that they face and other times because they've decided not to pay up for contracts um, for ready-made garments, for example, that I mentioned in the past. And um, what do you think will be the impact on the wider international markets and maintaining those supply chains and protecting workers in some of the poorest countries in the world where we need co co collaboration? Do you think enough has been done um, to protect lives globally and protect, make sure this pandemic response as, is, um, is one that is comprehensive, but also the economic response globally is comprehensive enough, in your view? So if, if I start with the supply chains, um, there's been a lot of damage to, uh, to supply chains already. I mean, um, uh, we talked earlier, I think Ben talked about uh, what has been happening in China. So in China, activity is back, uh, but actually uh, their export orders are much lower uh, than uh, their industrial, just general industrial activity, um, which just, just illustrates the spillover effects that we get uh, between countries. Um, I, uh, to some extent, this is uh, it's difficult to gaze in a crystal ball, but you can see that most countries want to have more resilience in their health systems, more resilience uh, in the way they will deal with uh, pandemics in future. And some of this will go to uh, freedom of movement globally uh, and the way in which that is managed. And I think it's inevitable that having experienced a shock like this, um, uh, we will uh, be in for a period where, where both emerging markets, uh, advanced economies, all countries, just think about those issues about how do I deal with risk necessarily that comes from abroad and how do I ensure resilience. And what is important to that, that is that we recognize um, actually that uh, A, globalization enables you, yes, it does 
expose you to risk from other countries, but actually an integrated global economy also allows you to share risk uh, with And does uh, it have a, country. can I just ask, does it have a knock-on effect on our ability to do trade deals with non-EU countries in this um, context? I, at the moment, I don't know how um, this will play out in terms of trade policy, um, yeah. but I think um, uh, countries will want to think about you know, how they control risk that could come uh, from abroad. The key is that this is not allowed, I mean, that we go for, if I call some responsible forms of self-reliance, yeah. but it doesn't lead to a more general unraveling of globalization uh, and global supply chains for some of the reasons you mentioned. One, because it's, I think, um, uh, it's um, uh, a way for us uh, to, to share risk. Two, because it's been a very important motor of uh, lifting large sections of the world uh, out of poverty, and that comes back uh, and uh, benefits us all. And three, I'd say if we want the health systems in uh, less developed countries mm. and emerging markets to actually be capable of dealing uh, with uh, this sort of health crisis in the future, bearing in mind that we are connected to them, we have to mm. have a system globally that allows them to grow and have the resources uh, to do that. On the second part of your question, has enough been done yet uh, for less developed uh, and emerging market countries? We don't yet know how the, the health crisis will play out uh, mm. in those countries, but it's clear they'll be hit by so-called spillovers from advanced economies, remittances will be lower, trade will be lower, their exports will be, uh, will be hit. And then of course, they'll have to cope to an extent we don't yet know with the actual pandemic uh, itself. And I think the next stage of this bluntly has to be considering, again, how we support those countries uh, through this crisis, because it is ultimately in our interest yeah. uh, to do that. The world has become kind of so connected that one can't simply say, let's put up the barriers uh, yeah. and do that. It's our long-term interest to do that as well. Thank you very much.